Hey everybody, can you hear me? Is this working? Huh. Hope so. Okay, believe it or not, people have been asking me questions about the section review that I assigned. So I felt that I would go over it. No, it's shocking. But before I do, I'm going to uh, torture you with a corny joke. So uh, it's a question. Um, where would be a good place to store a German sausage? The answer is in a worst case. Worst, you know, like German sausage. Worst. Did you know? Okay, sorry about that. Probably better next time. Worst case scenario. All right. So anyway, I I signed lots of questions. Now I'm going to uh, have a lecture coming up on the next topic, but before we move on, I guess it makes sense that I should go over the answers, so let's go through them. Let's go through them. Number one, on page 198, uh, describe the attractive forces and repulsive forces that exist between two atoms as they move closer together. I don't think this one was very difficult. Uh, the attractive forces exist because the positive nuclear charge of one atom is attracted to the electrons of another atom. So they are pulling together. And then, of course, the repulsive force is the protons of both, both nuclei repelling and the electrons of both atoms repelling so there is this balance um but what happens is when it gets into the right spot the uh, covalent bond is formed the atoms lose their potential energy and that's a very happy state of existence for the two atoms and they exist as a molecule okay number two compare all right, I'm going to skip number two. Atoms are spring. Yeah, they're moving, even though they're not flying apart. They're connected, but there's always some movement involved. This is the kinetic theory of matter, where atoms stop all that movement at the uh, point of absolute zero. Of course, this is theoretical, but theory and science is not like I have just a guess or a lucky guess. It's based on lots of empirical evidence. Number three. In what two ways can two atoms share electrons when forming a covalent bond? Well, there's really only two ways, equally or unequally. That's it. Equally, it's nonpolar. Unequally, it's polar. Well, that was easy. Four, what happens in terms of energy and stability when a covalent bond forms? Uh, potential energy goes down and stability goes up. And the opposite occurs when it separates. Number five, how can the partial charges be shown. Uh, the authors of the textbook are saying, literally, how can it be shown? And they meant by using the symbol lowercase delta plus sign as a superscript next to an atom. or lowercase delta negative 
It could be shown for another atom. That's how it's shown. I think that's what they meant. Not complicated. What information can be obtained from knowing the electronegativity differences between the two elements? Um, the bond type, uh, if there's not a lot of difference, it's a nonpolar covalent bond. If it's a little bit more, it's, non -po it's polar covalent bond. It's very different. It's, it's not even a covalent bond at all. It's an ionic bond. Obviously, the cutoff is arbitrary. You know, is the bond that much difference if there's one hundredth of an electronegativity value different between one and the other when it's right on the edge? It's sort of a gray you know, area. It doesn't just turn from one thing to another. People were asking me some questions about that. So, But we have to have a guideline, and so they... It's a fuzzy border, like uh, a lot of things in life, a lot of gray areas in life. But I digress. Seven, why do molecular compounds have low melting points and low boiling points relative to ionic substances? Well, you remember when I melted the sugar and I couldn't melt the salt? The salt was an ionic compound, and it had a very high melting point. The sugar, much lower. Still a connection. The covalent bonds are, exist and exist to the point where they're strong enough that it could be a solid at room temperature. But the, it's, it's a weaker attraction. It doesn't take as much energy. Therefore, it has a lower melting point. And, uh, and that's good for bakers, which... Uh, we probably, people are doing a lot of baking during this corona quarantine. Perhaps you're baking. Because when you go to the store, there's a lot of flour that's missing from the shelves. Because um, people have a lot of time. Eight, what is the distance between two nuclei? in a covalent bond vary uh, because some atoms are bigger than others and of course the energies of the atoms are different if they have a very strong bond energy the the uh, bonds are, are closer together but also the atoms are bigger so there is that physical attribute that physical aspect nine how does a molecular orbital differ from an atomic orbital well, an atomic orbital, as we know, the S's and the P's and the D's and the F's, describe electrons in an isolated atom, and they surround the atom. And um, the molecular orbitals are where the electrons are located in a covalent bond that are shared between the two atoms, and there, there is a little difference there. And I'm going to elaborate on that in my next video. But that's the answer. Um, 10. How's it going so far? <laughs> How does the strength of a covalent bond relate to bond length? The higher the bond energy, the shorter the bond length. Compare the degree of polarity of HF, HCl, HBr and HI. Well, I love this question. I'm going to take out my little assistant mini periodic table to help me show you the answer. Notice that HCl is H and chlorine, and HBr is H and bromine. And HF is HF there, H fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. See, do you notice, do you remember these are the halogens? Okay, and do you remember their electronegativity of all the periodic table elements go 
down as you go down and up as you go across. So that means it must be going down as you go down the halogens. So therefore, the polarity would be greater here and it would go down as you go down this particular group. See how it makes sense? Yeah, that's the answer. Oh, by the way, love it. Okay. Twelve. Given that it has the highest electronegativity, can fluorine atom ever form a nonpolar covalent bond? Yeah. Because it. can bind with itself. And that's as nonpolar as it gets. We're gonna learn about that in the next section too. Uh, 13, I'm on 13, see how time flies? What does a small electronegativity difference reveal about the strength of a non-covalent bond. The, the smaller the difference, the weaker the bond. And it slides to a stronger bond as you go into the differences where you get to ionic bonds, which are very strong indeed. Now look at these values. You have HS, right there, SI, CL, Great if my left handed handwriting is not as neat. And CS BR. Which one has the highest degree of ionic character? Well, if you look on the periodic table, CS, cesium, is a metal. If that's a metal and this is a non metal, that is an ionic bond. Can't get any more ionic than that. Metal, non-metal. Do you remember that? Well, so you could actually look them all up and measure the differences, but that would just jump right out at you. Now, of course, um, you don't have to worry too much about that because there's not going to be a test, but those are the answers. Um, some people had some questions. I hope I kind of answered everything. Um, and I'll try to elaborate more in my next video if I forgot anything. So look forward to that.